Hi and welcome back. In this video I'm going to share an extract from my presentation in the upcoming GM Forum on Long Covid and ME-CFS. It's an online conference running from the 17th to 19th of July with some fantastic speakers, all completely free to watch live. My presentation is on everything that we've learnt about Long Covid in the last 12 months. And in this particular extract, I talked to Dr. Eric Gordon about the new evidence for viral persistence and why it remains such a compelling theory for long haulers. We start the clip with Dr. Gordon talking about the potentially complex causes of long COVID and why some people might succumb to it whilst others don't. Hope you find it interesting. I'm, my big thing is a lot of this is, I think, is, in, is toxin and infection load and TBI. I mean, there's, there's, it, it's multiple insults. I think that's, it, it, there's, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but there's some very interesting research at the University of Denver that they haven't even published yet, that they can look at the differences in exosomes from your astrocytes. <laughs> uh, and if somebody has had long COVID and TBI separately, they don't cause much of an inflammatory response in a, in, in a mouse model of a brain. Okay, but if they've had both, it's like blows up. Okay, we're talking so, about traumatic brain injury here for TBI. Yeah, I so see. I'm sorry, yeah. traumatic brain injury and um, and the uh, and and having long COVID together is a much bigger problem. And we see this because it's the same thing in the tick-borne diseases. You know, one or the other together they cause more problems. Well, I was going to pick up just two points on what you were saying there. Yeah. So the first of which about TBI yeah. and long yeah. COVID. Maybe something, maybe nothing. I've had concussion quite badly a couple of times before. And funnily enough, my signature PEM symptom feels like I'm hugely concussed. It's almost identical to that feeling of what it was like when I smashed my head up for a couple of weeks. Um, is it possibly a similar mechanism or not? I don't know, but it's an interesting observation that it feels exactly the same as TBI to me when I'm heavily PEM. Um, the other, the other metaphor you were going down there with looking at the bodies on the battlefield and trying to work out who caused the war. Well, um, I like that argument or that <laughs> metaphor. And one of the suggestions for who caused this war um, is persistent virus, right? And I would just like to give my insight or my rationale on where we sit with this at the moment with um, relevance to a couple of studies that have been published in the last year as well. So. I, in a nutshell, I think that we will probably find that persistent virus is part of the puzzle for some, but not all, long COVID. So how do we work out who and where without chopping everybody up into tiny pieces and biopsying every part of them? It's pretty difficult, right? We know that, let's say, I'm just going to make up some numbers on some of this. Let's say that half of people with long COVID would fit an MECFS diagnosis. That is to say they are energy limited, spoons limited, and they will yeah. suffer from post-exertional malaise. We know that MECFS can be triggered by an initial infection that subsequently goes away. Persistence isn't necessary to start that disease mechanism that is MECFS. So it stands to reason that you don't necessarily have to have persistent virus in order to suffer from the MECFS version of long COVID, but you still might. It's not excluding that. <laughs> what about the people who don't fit the MECFS diagnosis? Is it more likely, perhaps, that that other group who have the tinnitus and the loss of smell of taste and the other neurological symptoms and the shaking and all of this other sort of slightly unusual stuff, is it more possible there? Well, we just don't know. But I think, as a general rule, I think we're starting to see more and more evidence that persistence is possible in all sorts of ways we might not have imagined five years ago. We just don't quite know what to do about it. So two, two studies that came out th in this last year. There was one from Furtado et al. that looked at uh, SARS-CoV-2 persistence in semen. Um, and they looked at men three months and six months after infection and found that there was viral RNA in 55% of them. Oh. So suggesting that there may be persistence somewhere in the genitory urinary tract. Again, like not where we would have thought to look, but oh God, what's it doing down there? <laughs> and does it go away eventually or not? And also frightening because the testes and the brain both have a blood brain barrier that usually keeps bugs out. <laughs> there's so the, this there's is the, the, 
So anyway, this but, is the so, funny so, thing. Pets. Yeah, this is the funny thing with SARS-CoV-2. We're finding it in all sorts of places it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. You know, we've looked at autopsy results of people and got, oh my god, it's in their brains. It's not supposed to be in their brains. It's in their really? cerebrospinal fluid. It's not supposed to be there. Um, there was another study uh, that was published in Nature that looked at primates, um, and this was one where they, because they were primates, I think they actually did that cutting up and killing the <laughs> the, the primate to actually do the biopsies, and they found huge degrees of persistence in the lungs and brains after three months. And again, they only went for three months. They didn't go to three years. But if it's there after three months, it, you know, you would expect the normal innate immune response and the adaptive immune response to have cleared that within a few weeks. So if it's still there at three months, it stands to reason it can be there at a year or longer. Um, and we've certainly had other samples and other biopsies come back at periods over a year that have been positive too. So on the viral persistence front, it's a very, as a, from a patient perspective, it's a very attractive idea. And I say attractive idea because it makes this whole intangible, unfathomable, brain-twisting condition slightly more understandable. And because that's the cause. You can point at it and you can say, that's the problem. And it also gives you not just something to blame <laughs> for this condition, but also... <laughs> something to attack and something to do something about that gives you the possibility of getting, well, maybe if you get rid of the virus, then you get better, right? So it's quite an attractive idea. And I notice with my YouTube channel that anytime I put a video up about viral persistence, it gets far more engagements than generic videos about biomarkers, for example. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bigger part of the puzzle, but it's it's interesting how how much as from a human and from a patient perspective right. how much we want viral persistence to be a thing. Now we don't know how much of a thing it's going to prove to be and how many long COVID patients. We don't know how big that sum number is, or indeed, even, so the other thing we've got some evidence as well that suggests that people who have had COVID and no longer well have had COVID and never developed long COVID. Uh, that some of them probably have viral persistence as well. So the, as we were talking about earlier, it's the body's response to the insults as much as the insult yeah. itself. Hope you found that extract interesting. If you'd like to take part in the conference or watch any of the presentations during the 17th to 19th of July, then there's a link to register in the description. It's free to watch any and all of the presentations live during the event. If you want catch-up access, transcript or audio versions, then that's all available for a discount price of $37 instead of the normal $67. If you sign up for any of that after using my link from the description, then I will get a small commission. So thank you in advance if that's what you choose to do. Next up on the channel is part two of my interview with Dr. Ben Sinclair, where we talk about treatment. So that will be up in the next few days. Look after yourselves. Until next time.